Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Wilds. This is my son, uh, Josh uh, Wilds, uh, that's here, Josh Wilds. Um, and a real privilege for us to be here. Uh, my father, uh, rest his soul, passed away a little over than a month ago. He had started our law firm in 1960. Um, he was actually John Lennon and Yoko Ono's immigration lawyer when the President of the United States wanted to deport him from America. And in a five-year battle, he took on the Nixon administration. Not only did he fix John's green card, but the whole law of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, came out of there. So you can say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the old one. This was uh, the act of a scholar, my father, his grandfather, and of course, um, a real uh, talent in Mr. Lennon, who wanted to live in America, who pursued his dream, his art, his voice, as you are pursuing yours. And it's our privilege to help you and to be here today. Our office is in the same building Dad started the practice on 53rd and Madison. I'll go through what it's like, what our fees are like, and we do this without fee on principle in order to help you. And I hope those that are watching this uh, now or virtually will have the uh, benefit of uh, some extra leg up into what we consider to be the greatest uh, golden experiment uh, in the world, and that is the United States of America. So let's do this. Life after F1, a guide to international students. So what is immigration law? Well, it's a series of statutes, regulations. It's a series of alphabet agencies from the Department of State, Homeland Security, USCIS, ICE, all the acronyms that you'll ever hear of. But it's basically getting permission to come to the United States. How many people here are in F1 visas? Anybody here on a J-1 visa? Okay. So we're going to concentrate on your journey uh, today. It starts on the left, if you look at the screen, and that is coming to America as a B-1, B-2, a visitor, the, the most weakest of visas for brief, innocent, and casual visits. Then you get an F-1. You get a one-year OPT. It allows you to be here for practical training, and then you can try to get those professional work visas. If you're clever enough to get a visa that allows for a dual intent, you can then apply for lawful permanent resident, a green card. Five years later, you can get citizenship or three years if you're in a marriage. Um, and we're gonna go through it. There are generally two statuses that a person has and there are three ways to get status in this country. You're either considered a non-immigrant or an immigrant. The three ways of getting status is either based on a relationship to somebody, based on employment, or based on investment. There is a presumption of immigrant intent. You'll see when you come to the airport, these examiners, they're very cocky. They're like this, with their gun and their badge, and you know, like this. Bring it on, why? Why are they bringing it on? Well, I teach in a law school. It's because you have to prove that you're leaving. You can't say, I'm getting married to an American citizen, I'm entitled to be here, or I have an F-1 visa, or I'm an OPT. No, sorry. You remember, you're on the other end of the scale. If you have a wedding ring and you're on your OPT and you're coming in and you're engaged to a citizen, they can start asking questions. They can start looking through your iPhone. Well, just because I'm engaged to an American doesn't mean I'm gonna stay here permanently. You have to be able to find your voice, understand your vulnerability, and be able to account for it. And that presumption of immigrant intent is, again, negated completely in the statute if you get yourself an H visa or an L visa or other visas. And it's something that portends itself, not just when you apply for visas, but when you go for extensions. And that presumption applies um, when you're going for visas at embassies and all the different steps of the way. Two terms of art that you should know, that is changing status and adjustment of status. A person who has a temporary visa and is going into Another temporary visa, you're an F1, you want to get an H1, they're both temporary visas, you're changing your status, quote unquote change. If you're going from a temporary visa to a green card, you're adjusting status. Those legal terms are important, not just to lawyers, but for you, because the petitions that make these changes or the adjustments are driven either by an employer, certain family members, or by yourself. Let's do the F1. I'm gonna run through this very quickly because my lecture is on life after the F1, but I want you to make sure that you present yourself in a skilled 
and proper fashion. So you're enrolled in a full-time matriculated student as an academic program. You're allowed to stay here as long as the I-20 says it, and you have to be able to prove you have sufficient funds, maintain your residence abroad with no intention of giving it up. It could be your parents, and you're admitted for DS, duration of status, which is a very special status, by the way. If you overstay as a student, and you've never ever changed from that DS, you don't accrue unlawful presence, which is amazing, because you could be here four or five years illegally, and then if you want to get a visa, you're not in any way vulnerable when you go to the American Embassy abroad. If you change out of that DS from an F1 to another status, you lose that special insulation, and I'll explain that to you later in the session. There's also a 60-day grace period after your I-20 expires, um, and your employment authorization document also expires, and that comes uh, to play heavily. So how do you maintain your status as a student? Well, make sure that you have minimum of 12 credits, that your passport, I-20, are on you at all times. How many people here have their passport in the room there? Nobody. How many people have their I-20s on them, the original? Nobody. Now, this is a very big problem. How many people have a copy of it on their iPhones, at least? Everybody. That's better than nothing, but it's not what the law requires you to do. Okay, but you want to know what you should do, where you should have it. If you lose it, you have major problems. If you carry it, you, you know, you're staying within the lines of the law. You have to understand the exposure you have if you're out Thursday night, you go to the meatpacking, which is a hot button area for immigration lawyers Friday morning when people get into trouble stupidly because they're at the wrong place at the wrong time, you want to make sure that you have proper documentation. If you don't want to be out after certain hours, you don't want to be in certain neighborhoods of Manhattan with the wrong crew because of what's happening right now with the migrants, with a lot of things going on. I want to talk to you a little bit about the culture of how you protect yourself in this beautiful city that we call uh, Manhattan. Keep the Office of Student Affairs updated on your enrollment, where you live. If you leave the United States before completing your program, make sure that you have permission for extensions. Uh, and again, you are required to carry a passport uh, all the time. How do you violate your student status? If you don't maintain full-time employment, if you engage in any authorized employment, you may love volunteering by a charity or doing something, but you're not allowed to work even if you're not being paid. You have to be very careful. Failure to get work authorization uh, or, or proper authorization to withdraw from a class or extend a program, transferring to a school improperly. If you don't file service procedures or if you get a, a, arrested for any capacity, you violated your uh, status. Any criminal activity can jeopardize your right to be in the United States. Um, Sephora's, uh, prosecutes shoplifting. We have people who pay more money in consultation fees than they stole at Sephora, and then they get an email from the American Embassy in their home country that your visa is now in jeopardy while you're in America. You want to be very careful. Uh, when you're traveling as an F1 student, if you travel, make sure that the DSO authorizes you uh, to travel, that the advisor's signature is only valid for six months, that you don't have uh, any other exposures, your F-1 visa stamp is valid in your passport. There was a question, somebody came to me right before the session about travel when you're on OPT. You still need a visa to enter the United States. If you have 12 minutes left of OPT, you don't want to go into the American Embassy and ask for a visa. So when you travel and what you're traveling for becomes a conversation uh, with your lawyer if you'd like to discuss it. Make sure you're valid. your passport is valid for at least six months. Uh, beyond the day you plan to re-enter America, they won't let you in unless you have a passport with a long enough uh, runway. So this is your travel abroad checklist, a valid passport, U.S. visa, the I-20, or the right forms if you're a J-1, the DS-2019. Uh, no, even for travel within America, you're required to carry all of this um, documentation, even for domestic travel. And yes, it's okay if it's on your iPhone, but it's not okay legally if you get pinched or stopped. So be uh, so guided. A driver's license, you're allowed to get it. There's a whole process. And I want you to keep this PowerPoint that's there for your benefit and you can look at it. Income tax returns, you are obligated even if you don't make money. You're not allowed to make money without the right authority to work. 
but you have to report and you have to file a tax return. It's the form 8843. Make sure you do it and that you do it in a timely fashion. You don't need an accountant or to do it, but I recommend that you at least talk to one if you're not sure how to handle it. There are two kinds of work authorizations you have when you're in F1. There's something called CPT and there's something called OPT. CPT is curricular practical training. The government authorizes you by your DSO to work uh, after one full academic year. Uh, in this capacity, it's limited to 20 hours a week when school is in session and 40 during holidays and breaks. If you complete a full year of CPT, you're not allowed to get OPT. So the trick is keep it to 11 months. It's basically charged by economic necessity. The government doesn't want you to have to end up um, leaving because you can't afford your tuition uh, and so forth. They don't want you to become a public charge. OPT is the one that's sexy and everybody is here to learn about, and that is you get a one-year OPT, optional practical training, related to the field that you studied. Everybody here is going to run a hospital someplace in the United States, God willing. And you are, if you're getting a degree in public health administration, allowed to work in that arena. Are you allowed to wait tables in a coffee shop during your OPT period of time? Why not? It's not related. Now, if you were studying acting in America, would you be able to wait tables? Yes. Because you're studying mannerisms and interactions and the way people talk and scream and kind of regard one another. So I want you to understand a hospital is a big institution. It's got a lot of nuance. And the whole health experience post-pandemic has a lot of nuance to it. So we're going to kind of extrapolate this. And you're not allowed to go 90 days without working because then your OPT is vulnerable and you're vulnerable. So, and you don't have to be paid during OPT, you have to work. So you can volunteer in a hospital or a medical center or someplace, and you can then shore up that exposure that you might have. But again, it's not tied to a particular employer, the field of study. You have to get the employment authorization document before you can go on the payroll of the company, and you get one year OPT for each year of ascending degree. You get a bachelor's degree, you get OPT. You get a master's, you get OPT. You get a PhD, you get OPT. You want to go for a second master's, you're not getting an OPT. You had a question? Yeah. Um, if you, I know you have multiple jobs on OPT. Yes. So if you have one job, it's directly related to the employment of the study your second job. It's only allowed to stay in your lane. You can't do the one job related to your space and then you're working in Starbucks on the side. Unless the Starbucks is in a hospital and you're feeding doctors coffee and you're talking to them about the hospital. You know, I'm being imaginative here, but stay in your lane. Don't, don't create things because all of a sudden you're in social media and it says, I love my time that I worked in Starbucks. Immigration sees this and said, when did you work in Starbucks? What was your authorization? You don't want to draw outside of the lines. Um, beginning in March of last year, USAS was phasing in premium processing for work authorizations so that you can move as quickly as you need to. There are reporting requirements and again, that 90-day accrual is very important. Now, anybody here a STEM student? Okay, cool. Um, they call you nerds in the, in the world of academia, but you're rock stars as far as immigration lawyers are concerned because you get three bites uh, at OPT with the prayer that you'll be able to apply for uh, an H-1B visa. You get three shots at the apple. Um, you have to be currently participating in OPT with a U.S. employer who's also involved in the E-Verify uh, system. You're allowed to get a social security number also as you're a, a student and you need that in order to trigger uh, payroll and you can get that if you show the proper uh, documentation. Now, how many people here have an EAD on them? Anybody? A work authorization document you do? Okay, so the card itself has a date that it's valid and then a date that expires. So do not fall asleep while I talk because this will put you out, okay? Visas are good in October of every year. The year, fiscal year for immigration does not start in January, it starts in October. Another rule, a governing rule is that you're allowed to apply for visas six months before you're eligible to do it. So H-1B visas, a professional work visas, there's only 65,000 of them a year. They're effective in October. You're allowed to apply for them in April. 
What if your work card expires before April? What do you do in that gap? What if your work card expires afterwards? Very confusing to you. But the first thing you want to do, and without a fee, you'll take our card. The blue brochure has my email underneath my photo, but you'll, you can call my son or myself. The minute you get your work card, without a fee, we'll just talk to you a few minutes on the phone. You're allowed, you have how long your grace period, guys, when your F1 expires? 60 days. 60 days. So let's say you're work author and, you, and you're allowed to apply for the H-1B in April, correct? In March, next month, people are applying for the H-1B lottery. That's when it opens. You have to put in for the lottery. If you get selected, you can apply for it in April. If you get approved, you can then go on the visa in October. The one thing you don't control here is what's in your pocket, your wallet. You know that commercial for Capital One, what's in your wallet? Well, you pull out your work authorization card, it's gonna expire when it expires. So if you're within 60 days of April 1 when you can apply for that H1, you're covered, you're good, you're gold. If it's more than 60 days, you're screwed, you're dead, you're not gonna be able to apply for an H1. Okay, critical that you understand that. You're gonna get a full year OPT, but there's going to be something called cap gap. The H-1B cap of 65,000 then will expire at a certain point if whether or not you're eligible for it. This is a hot button topic, very hard for you to kind of compose, unnecessary for you to be lawyers because you're going into partially the medical profession, but you need to have a good lawyer look at your card and kind of walk you through uh, what this means. So let's talk about some of these visas and it'll all come to you a little more naturally. The first part of this session generally is not done by immigration lawyers because you have a wonderful DSO in an office here that really knows what it's doing. But I wanted to set the stage so that I can answer questions that come up uh, generically. These are some of the visas that we're going to talk about. First is the H-1B. You're all experts on it. You need to have a degree and a pulse. How many people here have a bachelor's degree at least already? Okay. When you came to this country, you already had a bachelor's degree? Did you know you could have done an H-1 last year already? You could have, and maybe you, could, you should have, but it's gotta be related to your degree. So if your degree was in something not related in this space, it's unlikely you could have had somebody do it. But I have a lot of students that here on F-1s, they get an employer to do an H-1 the year before they even do their masters because they're eligible once they have a bachelor's degree at a pulse. Very simple. Your degree has to relate to the field of study. If it doesn't relate to it, you can't do an H-1B, although you can be imaginative. We've had uh, people that have stud studied botany or sciences, then hired in the world of finance, in the biotech space. You are in a very provincial, smart area. Your degree prepares you to do the professional work in a hospital situation, and the government's gonna recognize that you can't do this job without a degree. It's called a specialty occupation uh, for that reason. The US petitioner must offer you a prevailing wage. This is why they only like doing H's, but they love OPT. Anybody wanna guess why? Why do employers love OPT and they only like H's? They have to pay you a prevailing wage as an H-1, where they can pay you minimum wage as an OPT. So does it pay for you to find out day one if the place you're working for is going to sponsor you for an H-1? Yeah. Now listen, if they say, no, we don't do it, it's not our policy, we're not sure, then you have to weigh with a lawyer, is this good on my resume, am I wasting my time, should I go someplace else? That's the workshop. I do an H-1B workshop with students in all uh, schools throughout the tri-state area, throughout the nation for that matter. And that's the calibration you have to make. A job is better than no job, but if they're not gonna sponsor you, what's your plan? Are you lined up for another visa? Now maybe they fall in love with you. Maybe they're already in heavy light with you. Now there is something very special about H-1s and that's the portability clause. It allows you to pivot from one employer to the next once you get one. And there is a market where hospitals and organizations are looking for people who already have an H. Which is why you want to apply for an H-1 before you even come to America if you're doing your master's because you could have already done it with a bachelor's. 
And that's why it's important. You can get your H1, get it selected and bank it, and then go back on your F1, use your OPT. That H1 is good for a six year period of time. You can then activate it later on. You're also allowed to recapture every day, every week, every month that you didn't use your H1 in America. You can physically recapture it, which is an amazing experience. Think about that. If you're physically in the United States and you go on vacation to China, to Japan, Ethiopia, wherever you hail, and you're out for a month for Christmas time, you can recapture that period of time. So this is a wonderful visa. In the statute, it allows for a dual intent. So on a Monday, you get your H-1. On Tuesday, you can apply for a green card. You can pivot to another employer in the portability clause, and you can recapture every day, week, and month that you've never used it. That's basically the H-1. In fact, there's a special law, and I teach this in the law school. If by year five, you applied for a green card that's cooking for a full year, when the sixth year of the H-1 expires, you can extend your H-1 until you're finished. We have people on H-1s for 10, 11, 12, 13 years. They're, you're allowed to extend it so long as the employer is with you. It's really too bad if you lose your job in that extra period of time and you have to be very careful uh, that you have a good lawyer who understands what they're doing when you're here and you still haven't applied for a green card in year three, four, five, and so forth of the H-1. So there's an annual cap of 65,000 visas. There's a set aside of that number for 5,200 from Chile and Singapore. And there's an additional cap of 20,000 people who have a master's degree from a U.S. institution. So you go into two lotteries. If you get a master's from this beautiful institution, you try one lottery of 20,000, and then you do the other one. Almost 50% of the lottery entries this year had a U.S. master's degree. Keep going to school. It's another way to perch. It's like a bird who needs to land at some point. If you don't get selected, go for another degree because you get another OPT, but come see a lawyer who can plan other alternatives based on your nationality, based on all the other visas you're gonna learn now. So we talked about the portability clause. Uh, by the way, I'm also a mayor in New Jersey where I live. I'm the mayor of Englewood, New Jersey, right over the bridge. So I have a part-time job as a mayor and I have a full-time job as a lawyer. You can have two full-time jobs, two part-times, when we start hearing from a client that they're not happy or I may lose my job, you start finding another concurrent H-1. You're allowed to have multiples of the same visa. Now you can have a H-1 banked for you when you're an F-1 and not use it. You can only use one type of visa at the same time, but when you get it, you can have concurrent, so you can have part-time employment in different things as well. And again, it allows for a dual intent. There is a 60-day grace period if you're terminated, and they are responsible to send you back home if you don't onboard to another employer. And you can go to that B-2 visitor's visa to pivot. Now, once you're no longer an F-1 and you've applied for the H, you lose that duration of status. I just want you to understand that insulation comes in handy and so forth. Here are the key dates for this year, guys. The lottery entry date is March 6th at noon till noon on March 22. You will find out before March 31st if you were selected. And if you were selected, the October 1st is the governing date when it starts. You have to file by April 1st. And the expiration date of your OPT, you wanna keep an eye on that because of that 60 day grace period that we talked about, the cap gap. You call us, we'll walk through this timetable without a fee as a courtesy uh, when you call our office. So, the interview process. You're now looking for jobs, you find a job. What can an employer ask you? Only a few things. Are you authorized to work in America? Okay? After employment, can you submit a birth certificate of other proof of citizenship or, or right to remain in the United States? And do you have any language abilities that would be helpful in doing the job? They're not allowed to ask anything else. You understand? Are you authorized to work in the United States? That's the only question really they should be asking. There are discrimination laws that prevent employers from discriminating and asking for certain documents. And there's the Office of Special Counsel that was set up specifically related to unfair employment practices. Be careful is what we tell employers. And you should be super sensitive by the words that people use and the tone that they take whether or not they're interested in sponsoring you and whether or not this is a culture of where you want to be. I'm telling you right now, my father used to tell us 
when I was dating my brother and I. It's good to date and it's good to break up. You, you'll make a more informed choice later in life. It's the most important thing for your green cards because if you get sponsored directly for a green card out of school, the employer is not gonna have as good a case as if you've had a few jobs before you. It's actually experience, knowing how to fall in love and fall out of love, looking for people with character, whether you're gonna marry them or you're gonna work for them is the critical experience here. And the more experience you get, the more flavor your case to work in America becomes for a new employer. What's the interview process that employers can't ask? They can't ask the following questions. Are you a native born or naturalized American? None of their damn business. Your birthplace, they may want to be cute and have a conversation. Where are you from? No, you can't do that. Questions which identify customs or denomination about your parents, your grandparents, your birthplace, requiring you to submit a birth certificate or naturalization or baptismal record before you work, or any other inquiry about the national origin about you, your spouse, your family. Is English your first language, your date of arrival, your port of entry, and proof of citizenship before you're even hired? I want you to understand how dangerous that is for the employer, and it should be an alert and an antenna for you that you may not want to be there, and you should take note of the conversation. Be knowledgeable about the process. Today you're doing the first thing by having a lecture and participating. Employers appreciate it if you're knowledgeable, and it'll give a, an employer a certain comfort that the process is not burdensome. Find your voice. Is it your practice to sponsor people for the H-1B visa? If they say, we've done it, done a few exceptions, it will let you know later, good. Oh, we've never done it. Um, would you be open to it? Yes, of course. Well, I have a best lawyer. His father was John Lennon, his grandfather was John Lennon's lawyer. I'll pay for the fees. You can pay for our legal fee, they just have to pay the filing fees. Find your voice, because if you like them, it's easy for you to, to love them, and it's the same recipro reciprocity that's there. Now, find out what the employer's discomforts are. They have to post part of the requirement to do the H-1B is a two-step process, first with the Labor Department, then immigration. They have to post in a hallway, in a kitchen, that there's a job available and what the salary is. That's uncomfortable for them to do. Also, they have certain record-keeping responsibilities, opening themselves up to something. And they have to pay you a prevailing wage. They may not want to pay the prevailing wage. So you can say, look, I won't work full time. If the full time job is $95,000, let me work three quarters of the time. Is that okay for you? Make sure you work commensurately with the hours and the payment and make sure that they don't take advantage of you. It's a, it's, a, it's a dual kind of relationship. On the one hand, America is trying to, with these posting, give Americans a chance to get a job and, and screw you. On the other hand, they don't want you taken advantage of, so they want to make sure you're being paid a proper wage. That kind of schizophrenia, if you would, in the immigration experience is something that we can speak toward, but it's a very elegant, very fine visa, the H-1B, and I recommend that you find your voice and have a consultation with us if we could be of use. Volunteer also that you'll need an H-1B. In your experience, it's much better and say, I'm on an EAD, I'm on OPT now, but I'll need H-1B sponsorship. Is that something you're familiar with? Remember, money does matter. You're allowed to pay the legal fees for an H-1B, and the employer is required to pay the anti-fraud fee and the ACRIA, the worker training fee. How do you increase your chances? You can't. This slide has to be ignored. It should not have been put in this slide, and I hope anybody who sees this, you cannot increase your uh, chances anymore with multiple employers. They're gonna look for a beneficiary, and if they see there's more than one, they're gonna kick them all out. What are the benefits of hiring an H-1B? Some people like it because you can only work for them. You have to go through the portability clause to go for someplace else, but you can only work for them. They tend to stay at their jobs longer than U.S. workers, statistically. It's a six-year visa. If you agree to terms that they'll file a green card for you by year three, four, then you have a healthy amount of time uh, to get it sorted and you can extend your time. Now let's go away from the H-1B visas and we'll play here. Any Canadians or Mexicans in the audience? 
Yes, Canadian. Yeah. Cool. That's kind of like attached, like uh, Goldie Hawn said, or Diet America, which is what I like to call it. Same language, same culture in many ways, but we treat Canadians and Mexicans very differently than the rest of the world, and they don't treat Mexicans with the same reference and respect, a reverence and respect that they treat Canadians, unfortunately. There's a lot of discrimination based on reciprocity, based on country relations, if it's good, if it's poor, and so forth. Um, Canada and Mexico have special uh, visas. It's the TN visa. If you're on it, you'll see it. If you qualify for it, it's a wonderful visa. While there's no statutory limitation on how many times you can have it, if you keep going for it 10, 12 years, you're gonna end up uh, being challenged that you have a dual intent and they won't let you stay on it. It's a great visa to pivot to. If you get it, you should still apply for the H-1. That allows for a dual intent, and it's a lot stronger. There's also the E-treaty traders. There's the E-1 if you're involved in trade. This community is not involved in trade. If you were a diamond dealer, an airline involved in product that's being manufactured and traded, that would be an E-1. An E-2 is if you start your own business. You have to start it in your own space, in anything. You can start a coffee shop. And I point to my nose when I teach my law students at Cardoza Law School. Why am I pointing to my nose? Because immigration will virtually come in and want to smell the coffee. This is a coffee shop. You're putting 200 grand into it. We want to see the red and white tablecloth. Where's the cheese from? Where's the coffee? How many employees do you have? How much revenue did you have? What are your expenses? What is your rent? You can't do an E2 unless the business is fully built out and you need a revenue, you need expense, they need to see all the parts. In your space, unless the hospital or the medical facility is owned by a companion national of your country, how, is there somebody here from Japan? Anybody here from Korea, from China? Give me countries, yes, what country are you from? China, we don't have E2 treaties with China. Right, so you have to look. Certain countries we have treaties with, certain countries we don't. Some have one, some have the other, some don't have either. But it's a wonderful visa that gives the spouse the generic authority to work here. Sometimes if somebody comes in and you're dating somebody, you're living with each other, you have two toothbrushes in the bathroom, and you don't want to kill a good thing by getting married, but you're married to somebody who wants to do one of these visas, the generic authority to the dependent spouse allows you to work for anybody. So don't discount what's in your wallet, as the commercial says, because there are things that you may have access to uh, as well. Any Australians in the audience? There's the E3 visa for Australians. It's kind of an H1B for Australians if you have a degree. It works in the same way, but it doesn't allow uh, for a dual intent. Um, oh, hitting the wrong button. Uh, there's the J visa. We have one person that has a J visa. There are extreme spaces where you can go from the F1 to a trainee or an intern, but very rare. The, this is a standalone visa in of itself. You'd be negated generally and holistically if you had a work authorization uh, related to your, um, the, uh, your uh, F1. Uh, and so forth. And it's also a very dangerous visa because it has a two-year foreign residence requirement if you're not on the skills list and, and things like that. So you want to make sure that you get that only in rare and extreme circumstances. There's the L1 visa for intercompany transfers. Sometimes there is there are medical systems that have affiliates or subsidiaries out of America. If you go on the payroll of a company abroad, and you're an executive or a manager or somebody with some proprietary knowledge and you transfer over into the United States system, then not only will you get a visa faster, but there's a fast track for a green card. It's a wonderful visa. So I want you to look, for those of you that are going globally with your experience, if there is uh, a constellation of companies in America and outside, there are ways for us to have you leave, come back, and get a green card even faster just by putting a year's time. You need 365 days boots on the ground in that home country. It doesn't have to be where you're from. It could be in a third country as well. Then you have the O visa. Anybody familiar with this visa? These are for people who are rock stars. You can't be a legend in your own mind. You have to be somebody important. So for those of uh, soccer enthusiasts, we represented Pele, he passed away about a year ago. 
He was like the Babe Ruth of soccer, and he uh, had an O visa. John George the chef, Boy George the singer. We have tattoo artists and scholars and all sorts of eSport players and just a lot of wonderful people. If you have a profile in your space, in your home country, or you develop it, you go back to Canada, you make a name for yourself or someplace out of America, you can then get this if you're a non-citizen of extraordinary ability. You need to get an advisory opinion from a peer group if one is customary. You have to usually hit three out of six or three out of eight standards. And then you could either do a direct job employer or you can use an agent and we assess your credentials. If you're fresh out of school, the government's going to push back on any awards or special accolades that you have. But if you write your own book, we've done this for Pilates instructors, and who, or you set up your own modules in, in the health space that you occupy, you can develop a nice name for yourself. Most of you guys are in the 20s, I presume, or 30s, correct? So this is more in the space that's connected to the health and the medical space once you've had a lot of writings, a lot of conferences you've spoken of, original content that you put out there, awards that you get. You have to put a distance behind you between you and your school and some kind of capable experience uh, and so forth. Um, the timing of this is something that's uh, delicate also. The dependent is not a lot of work. So the H1 dependent can't work. The E visa can work, the L visa dependent can work, the O visa cannot work, but at least it gives you the right to be here. And by the way, if you're in school on an F1 and you're getting married and the other person can get an E visa, as a dependent on the E, you're allowed to continue to go to school and you can work generically for anybody while you're in school. So there's a lot of tricks of the trade, as it were, for you to do this. Now, this next slide you can see, you don't want to violate your status. Any kind of crime that we discussed uh, is a violation. And there's also, if you overstay a visa, there is an exception. Again, if you overstay a visa, the, gar the governing rule in the United States is if you hear more than 180 days, six months, be careful because certain calendar years, there's less or more. If you hear more than 180 days, you have to step out of America for three years before you can do anything. If you're here for 365 days unlawfully or as an overstay, you have to step out for 10 years. It's called the three and the 10 year bar. If you are an F1 student in duration of status and you never changed to a visitor's visa or applied for another visa or anything, that insulation means you never accrue unlawful presence. That means, and I had this, we had an intern in our office. She was lovely. She did a great job and she was a model. And she came to us and said, I got a job in a model agency while she was in law school and I overstayed my visa for seven years. She was here illegally for seven years going to law school, but she got herself a great job. And guess what? She went to Romania, got herself the H-1B3 visa at the time in her passport and came back because she wasn't subject to this because she had DS. Now she had moved on to a different profession, different interest, but she had to do that job as a model and we had, we walked her through this. She suborned the risk. We write it in blood in the fee agreement. You realize they can make up all kinds of nonsense for you. They may want to find a problem for you. She had no criminal exposure, no nothing. She didn't want to live in America without being able to correct her status. And she didn't want to marry the wrong person for the right papers, which is something that I am a big fan of. We've never, I'm a former federal prosecutor, I used to deport people. My son used to work for the immigration courts writing decisions for judges. We will encourage a couple in a relationship with the toothbrushes in the bathroom to accelerate the timetable if it's the right thing for the couple and there's a benefit, but it's their choice. You never encourage a bad relationship or the wrong timing on a good relationship just to get an immigration benefit. So important that you stay within the lines. So how do you get a green card? Same path, either a relationship to somebody based on employment or based on an investment. Um, once you get sponsored in one of those myriad of ways, do you have to stay with the sponsor forever? No, there are certain rules. In fact, six months after your adjustment of status, the last stage, you're allowed to pivot and work for another employer. You don't have to stay with the same employer. But if you leave, at a certain stage, the government might take issue. And you know when they're taking issue? 
when you're applying for citizenship, they're actually looking. How did you come to America? How did you get a green card? Who sponsored you? When did you leave them? You have to keep those records and make sure that you left and that the application was done in good faith. So these are the five employment-based um, paradigms, if you would. The first one is the EB1. It's for extraordinary ability. Um, it's also for outstanding professors and professional and, and, and uh, researchers. It's also for those L visas who transfer over to the United States, people of extraordinary, exceptional ability, and so forth. The EB2 are for people who are doing national interest cases. You're working in the national interest of the United States. It can't just be in a post-pandemic world, I'm with a hospital. That doesn't work. You have to do something that does something specific uh, towards it. It's also the EB2 and the EB3 have to do with the labor certification, which is the old fashioned way of running ads in the newspapers and showing that there are no ready, able and willing Americans to take jobs. The process that People will love and work harder when they see that their parents and their loved ones, the immediate relatives, the president was scaring people that 30 people will be out there getting uh, green cards from you. It doesn't work that way. Getting citizenship is a beautiful, beautiful uh, privilege and ends that uh, space. These are some useful websites for you. Just a word on our practice. Started in 1960 in the same building where we're practicing. On 53rd and Madison, we have offices in Englewood, New Jersey, in Aventura, in Miami, by appointment only um, in uh, Los Angeles and in Tel Aviv. And we also have offices in Denver, all U.S. immigration uh, law representing major companies and wonderful people uh, like yourself. Be careful. The ethics here are such that we represent the petitioner uh, and sometimes the beneficiary or both. So you have to be careful. Just because you're paying doesn't mean that the immigration lawyer is you and your lawyer exclusively. We're known for our ethical propriety and we've been battle tested through uh, the decades. We educate our clients. We do sessions like this throughout the nation and we're known for our prompt and efficient service. This is our brochure. As you can see, um, it's been a real privilege. Literally dad practiced 64 years he toiled so nobly trying to help so many people have the thing that he had. He came from a small town in Pennsylvania and he recognized the American dream himself and then spent his entire career portending it to the rest of the world. I want you to double down and not be scared. If we have another four years of a president that's going to scare immigrants, understand that this country was founded on the backs of immigrants and they're doubling down on your journey and the nobility of what you're trying to achieve. And at some point, you'll get a status, you'll give it to somebody, and then they'll pay it forward to the next generation. It's harder for you because of language, because of timing, because of finance, because your loved ones may not be here, and you may have pressures at a distance. But that's why we can bank on that entrepreneurship and that ingenuity. And you are the greatest risk takers you are that very special DNA that makes up the United States. All I can say is it's been a privilege uh, for us uh, to uh, represent um, foreign nationals. Um, I met my wife, his mom, in my dad's class. I have two out of my four kids that are lawyers, and um, it's, immigration is in our DNA. It's in every American's uh, DNA, whether they appreciate it or not. It's up to us to bring out the conversation and lift the nobility of this. I hope that you'll call upon us. We charge consultation fees. My consultation fee is $700 for a full hour. Uh, Josh's is 500 and all the other lawyers in the practice also. I have a partner. We always credit the consultation fee to the case. It's a gimmick to use people from shopping and wasting time. Now that you've come to this lecture, um, we'll give you 20 minutes on the house without a fee. You can just call up the office, ask for me. I'll design somebody who'll give you 20 minutes on the house because you're more educated than most because you have a little more fluent than this. If you feel that you really want to develop a relationship, which I recommend, I do, I do a memo. Everybody does a memo after it, and we take follow-up phone calls, and we'll be there for you. And it might not be immediately. It might be later. Um, but we'll always make sure that we regard that, whether it's $1 or 
or whatever it is that we work with your budget and the payment plan and so forth. Um, that's basically my presentation. Cool. My pleasure. Did I stay within the hour? Yes, uh, so yeah, we'll definitely. So okay, we still cool. have time, so if you have any questions. questions. Yeah. Yes. What's your name? Linkle. Hi, Linkle. So, uh, so, as a graduate student, um, does it mean that we can start applying for it? Yeah, you could have done it if you came from your home country with a bachelor's degree a year ago. And I say that much to the chagrin of a lot of people and the prayer that somebody watching this uh, might think about doing something like that. But yes, if you've already got the degree, if you are an OPT, you're a fair game to apply for. Pleasure. Yes, sir. Uh, What's your name? Uh, I'm Dr. Tilhana. Hi, Dr. Pleasure. Uh, in your presentation, you said something about uh, the DS in the I-94. Right. Uh, so what, what does that exactly mean? You stepped out before, but the DS, duration of status, basically means that you don't accrue unlawful presence. If you're physically an American, you overstay the 60-day grace period, and the government doesn't find you, you never change your status, you never get a visa denied, then you cannot be done at an American embassy abroad because you accrued unlawful presence. Now, where do you hail from? India. They're going to find 30 other ways to kill you in India at the American embassy because they're very nasty there. Hyderabad, wherever it is that you go to, Mumbai, you know, Bombay. Um, so I don't, it's not going to give you any real benefit, but it does mean in a worst case, if you have to leave, that there's one provision of law that won't harm you. Uh, sorry, I-20 uh, data is uh, later this year, in August. Whereas my visa is valid till 2028. How does that work? What's valid till 2028? The visa. The visa is just a permission to come into America. That does not govern when you're here. What governs is the I-94, which is now electronic. That admission is what governs your right to remain here. The visa is just permission to come to America. You're lucky it's good till 2028. Don't lose your passport because it can be very tedious in India to convince them to give you a new one, and they look at everything with fresh eyes all over again. Once you're here, it's irrelevant because it was just an admission document. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Shanxi. So Hi, uh, if the visa ex is expired, will it affect my uh, OPT in any ways? Yeah, if your visa is expired and you want to travel, um, it depends what country you're from and what your experience is. You can go back abroad, but the American Embassy can then start challenging whether or not there's a problem with your case. Where's your home that you haven't abandoned? It's your mom and dad's. Show me proof that they own the house and that you're going to leave. You know, in other words, you got to be very selective. We don't like our students traveling whatsoever until the OPT is in their hand. Once you have a card, you can leave, but then you're asking for permission to come back so you can... You're asking for a band-aid. I don't think you should be going to the American Embassy for a Band-Aid. If you're going to the Embassy because you want to get a visa, a green card, or something substantial, I would do that. If you're coming from troubled parts of the world, or where we have uh, very difficult relationships, and I want you to understand now, even strong relationships, I'm getting pushback now from embassies throughout the world, where we get approvals domestically, an O visa, whatever it is, and then they push back at the Embassy, and you get stuck in administrative processing for three months, six months. Now you think you were going to go and come back, but they have an issue because your name matches some other person on a watch list, and it's going to take them six months to fix it. Now all of your plans got derailed. For what? Christmas? A vacation? To see somebody? Have mom and dad come here. Yes? Well, I'm Shivani. Um, Hi, Shivani. Uh, I was wondering if, if... Like the yogurt? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, after graduation, if I go on and work for a non-profit organization, and um, I get a non-cap H-1B, right. uh, and then if I find a job in, say, uh, the for-profit space, right. I, I, I cannot use the same H-1B visa, right? If you get there, I didn't say this, thank you, uh, Chibani, for uh, reminding me. There are cap exam jobs, too. What does that mean? I'm a professor at a law school. We bring in professors with schools of higher learning, they're cap exempt. If I get an H-1B for a law professor, 
and then they want to get a job in a law firm, they can't then transfer from that world into the CAP uh, world. They have to apply each year. I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, if the nonprofit, uh, say, um, files a green card for me, right. then on the basis of that green card, I can move to... Yeah, the once you get a green card, you're a free agent. Okay. So I want you to understand, when somebody comes into our office, and you come in with somebody else because you're in love, um, or wink, wink, heavy like, and you don't want to kill a good thing. I got, I have all kinds of things that I can play. I can play with the H1. I could also play with the other person's status and see if I can get a dependent. There's a lot of imagination that goes with this. I also want to tip my hat to you. You're going into a very noble uh, profession in a post-pandemic world as a mayor, as a lawyer who sees a lot of this kind of uh, traffic. You're going into the next generation of preparing people for the most vulnerable times. America has no appreciation whatsoever how important your jobs are, and they should be giving you a quick path. But until they figure it out, you're going to have to go through a bumpy road. Forgive them, and despite them, go forward. How many times do you see people in the medical profession being so gracious and kind to patients who aren't because they're frazzled? Look at the frazzlement and the politics and the dialogue that has deteriorated in Congress just as a symptom of a very robust, um, spoiled system, but it's still pointing in the right directions and still a great place to learn and to do your profession. Yes? Um, so in your experience, are the EDs you Yeah. How often do people get accepted or get rejected? We don't lose those cases. Now, I'm not allowed to tell clients when they email or call me uh, that I've never lost a marriage case. We haven't. Okay? That's just a fact. Because I won't take a marriage case unless I meet both people. I'm a mayor in New Jersey, so they come in with a, a label on their suit. Why are they coming with a label in the suit? Because they're going to take a picture with the mayor, get married, they're going to return the jacket. So it's a phony marriage. But when they come, I have to marry them. But when they come to me as a lawyer, I'm not going to put my license on that. EB-2 and EB-3 have no business filing it unless you're going to get it approved. Now, you can't guarantee to a client because there may be an American that's ready, able, and willing to do the job. You have to find the right book to write that application and get it approved. But so what? If you have a long runway ahead of you and you may have multiple bites at the apple of different ways of getting green cards, don't, don't thwart the process. Go through it. And there are a lot of tricks of the trade that are legitimate. Yes. Right. You need a you need a sponsor to do an EB two or an EB three. You cannot do it on your own. Um, at what point should you be looking now? Map out your plan. When you know, I was trained by my father. When a client comes in, they only want this. No, it doesn't work like that. The client doesn't realize. My father com compared it to. Our clients are hemophiliacs. They just, they're, they want everything. It's all coming out at one time. Yeah, they come in for a little portion, but in that first meeting, expand on the path. And that's what Dad did artfully for John Lennon. You have to uh, read his book. It's on, it's on Amazon. Um, when John and Yoko met with my father, he had no idea who they were, but he understood artfully what it was to help them and, and plan a path to getting green cards for the family. So when you see a lawyer, you want to make sure that you have a consultation, that you know the weak spots, and that you shore them up along the way, and that you deploy them. And if the case is not strong, what can you do to bolster it? Those are the things that we do along the way. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Tobe. Tobe. I'm sorry. What's your name? Usa. Pleasure. You just raise your voice if you can. Right, so the criterion, are you talking about the O visa? The EB-2. The EB-2, right. So the EB-2 um, for national interest, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what is it that you do? Um, so it's just like public but I'm just reading about it. Like, it's not free. Yeah, so the, you have to understand that you have to hit those things so smart, so heavy, so strongly. You just can't be in a profession 
like the medical field and say that's in the national interest. Although it was in our national interest to get in certain medical professionals during the pandemic, immigration never really changed itself uh, to conform to that. There's a big lobby from the American Medical and Nursing Association that works against it also. But I wouldn't promote, prom I, I don't believe that you would qualify for national interest. You, you, they're very strict about the requirements. So they might say you qualify for two of the requirements, but one you don't, so we're denying the case. So in, in any type of situation, yeah, if it's three out of 10 or three out of eight, whatever it is, you have to make sure you're meeting all of them. Yeah. These take, they take a long time also, the EB2s and EB3s. So it's something definitely they want to look forward to in the future. But they do take some, sometimes upwards of a year to two years to three years to five years to ten years, depending on where you're from. So you need to make sure you have some sort of status in the meantime also. So you could, in theory, start it whenever you want, even as a student. But you have to make sure that you're planning for that short term while you're waiting for the long term. Josh, stand up, handle the question. And anybody else have any other questions? I think those are. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would have a standard Yeah. So um, I have a class in does not qualify for a standard I do math, I do data analysis, so I did my summer apex for like a, as a data analyst. Yeah. But now I'm applying for jobs that says they only accept STEM extension, which I'm not qualified for. So, so if, if that's the case, then the, the STEM has to be verified on two ends by the employer who's using something called E-Verify through the government, mm -hmm. and it also has to be verified by the school. So if, you, if your degree is not a STEM, you're not going to be able to get those two extra years. There's no bigger than No, even if you've done something in the past that, has, that might qualify for mathematics, or you, maybe you went to engineering school as a bachelor's, you used that OPT and you want to try to use it again now, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get it. Okay. But it, but it, it depends. It, it might depend on the specific situation also where you went to school. I don't want to rule it out completely, but most likely not. Okay. Um, and then finally, in the interview, uh, how can we talk about the immigration, like sponsorship and stuff with their father? Is it like something like we should not? Yeah, I, I think the best advice my father gave today, because I see this a lot with students, because a lot of my clients are, are students, is being familiar with the process and finding your voice, being open about it. Um, I find that employers who don't sponsor H-1Bs, if you bring it up with them, and you don't know what you're talking about, they're just going to look the other way, thank you for coming, have a good day, and they're going to try to find someone else. But if you're open to them about it, yes, I'm on a, I have an EAD, I have a STEM extension, I can work for three years, I might require an H-1B lottery, you know, this is how it's going to work, the, the, they're not even going to batter an eye. It's really not a burdensome job, you know, like, if, as long as you have a good lawyer, it could be a very easy to get an H-1B, but if you're not familiar with it, it's like speaking a different language. And, so and, I, I would recommend speaking about it. Anecdotally, um, when we meet with clients, we violate those rules in three seconds. What's the first question? Do you have any adverse criminal history? Do you have any adverse immigration history? Are you single? How old are you? Are you married? Do you have any children? Do you want to marry the person sitting next to you? You know, all of these questions that we dip into their world are not questions that I can ask of an employer. So it's very easy when I, and hard at the same time when I start interviewing people for jobs, I have to put on the rails how I talk about it, and I'm also drawing conclusions. I want you to understand, um, and this is some generic advice because I'm old, um, and I used to be his age and a lot taller, but then I got married and I got short. No, so what, what ended up happening was um, when people don't show up with their resumes, oh, I emailed it, you should have it already, I don't hire them. I want you to use common sense when you do job interviews. Don't only be concerned about the immigration journey. That's just a component of it. Do your homework. Get there early. We came a half hour early for this lecture. How much money are we making out of this? Zero. Why are we doing this? With the prayer that we, you will pay it forward and you'll introduce us to people down the road. You have to understand, they're building your resume. You want to show up early, you want to find out if it's their policy before you get there, and if there is nuance to it, that you show your comfort in discussing it, and that you're not there just for yourself, but you're there for the, will you consider doing the visas if I do a good enough job, or who do I have to convince for you to want to do the visa? Don't be frustrated by it, and don't stand quietly, because again, You'll be, you'll be marginalized and forgotten if you don't stake your own territory. So find your voice, which is why consultations with lawyers are critical.
you also don't want them to think you're hiding something. So you don't bring it up in the beginning, then you get called back for a second interview, the job comes around, and then you tell them about sponsorship. That might make them even more upset. Sure. So it's better just to be open up front, at least from our experience. That's what we see. And I'm wondering my next question. So mention that in the first interview, uh, it's set. Okay. Yeah, I, that, I, I would. I mean, you also, every interview is different. It depends who you're interviewing with. You, it's, you know, read the room. Um, I interviewed when I was in law school, I interviewed for a few hundred jobs. My last name was Wild, so they knew I was going to end up working here at some point. I got rejected from everywhere, but I use it as a practice experience to talk to people. And I, I owned it. I brought it up. Yes, I, yes, my father is the partner of Wilds and Marburg. Yes, my grandfather is Leon Wilds. But here's what I want to learn from you. Here's how I can help you. Same thing. You should do the same thing. Now, I never wanted to work for anybody else. But I wanted I, to. I didn't either. I should say that. Yeah. But I wanted, I wanted, to, to, I wanted yeah. to learn. I wanted to learn how the government handled this so I wouldn't be fearful for my clients. And I wanted to see what clients went through. So I went to the airport, I wanted to see the holding pen. What's the computer screen? What are they looking at? What numbers? Yeah. When they look at somebody's shoes. So I want, what I want you to do is take your space, like I took my space, and see all sides of it. That's why the slides that we had were, what are the pressures of the employer? What are your pressures? What's the appropriate way? Now, if you have the good fortune to have already developed the trust of somebody while you're in school, or you have a leg up because of family, or you're a doctor, you have a, a a professional calling card already, use that to your advantage. And make a good immigration lawyer your tactician. Do a, a, do a, a review with that person before you go on the job. I'll always make myself available. We don't know how to bill by the hour, by the way. It's always by the project. We do the consultation fees to separate people that go shopping. But once we do that, you have access to my cell phone, my WhatsApp. You can call me 24-7 because my wife, his mom, looks at this as if it's an extension of our family, which is the way the relationship ought to be. Not a file, not a piece of paper, but your life. We also speak to employers a lot. So you might say to them, I might require sponsorship, but I've met with an immigration law firm is easily able to take it on and they're willing to speak to you, uh, which we do a lot for people. So we'll talk to the employer a little bit so that they're comfortable with what it means to do an H-1B. Mm -hmm. And then usually that, you, that's usually enough. Okay. Yeah, but it depends on the situation. Thank you. I've got this small question. No, that's no. a that's a violation or a citation that won't that won't affect their F visa status if it's just like a speeding ticket. Unless it ticket. was for controlled substance. Unless it's a DUI or something okay. like that, but it will be brought up uh, at the N four hundred stage when you're applying for citizenship. You do have to disclose all of your citations and violations, but it'll be overlooked as long as you paid whatever fine it was or you fought it, whatever it may be. So keep records of all of that stuff in case that happens. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Manali. So oh. I have a question. You mentioned that if we have two master's degrees, so we are eligible for the second master's. So does that also apply for a doctoral degree? Like yeah, so so for, o, for OPT, you only get extra OPT for every ascending degree. So if you go for a master's and you use your OPT, and then you go for another master's, you're not going to get it again. If you go from there to a doctorate degree, you'll get a new OPT. If you do two doctorate degrees, you'll only get one OPT. So it's only every time you go up the ladder. And you'll run out of money <laughs> yeah, on that's tuition. The, yeah. but you can't be a, a forever student in the United States, too, without raising eyebrows, too. Yeah. But if you're doing a, a lateral degree, you won't get any extra OPT on top. I'm a I know. I'm a student, uh, I'm a student, 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 I'm a now, if you go from master's to master's, then you'll just get that one OPT. But if you go from master's to PhD, for example, without using the master's OPT, you have likely lost it. Uh, the DSO might be, it, it depends if it's a joint program, so there's a lot of little nuances, but usually you'll lose it. Now, if you have wealth in your family, if you're going to be working outside of the United States, then you can afford not to take these little... Um, job interviews as seriously, it's a different kind of journey. But then you may be a candidate for an EB-5, let's buy the green card so that I have enough runway, in which case going for school and perching as an F-1 makes sense. But at some point, you want to decide what your relationship is going to be with the United States. It may get bumpy in the next few years, depending on who's president. 